you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I am your host, Mr. Brandon Elliott. I'm excited today. We have a gentleman that has been in the game for a while now and has actually built up to 1,000 units, 1,000 doors at this point, which is awesome. So a lot of knowledge and everything in between. But, but you know, this whole show is all about educating, motivating, and then preparing you to take action. A lot of us, just like myself, has been affected by... Uh, contractors and have really made a lot of mistakes in the past with contractors. That can be one of the biggest hurdles for a new investor to actually get started with. So today, this gentleman, he started off as a general contractor and very successful with that, has been able to help out so many people since you know uh, the early 90s um, in this industry and is still actually giving back today and showing people uh, how they can not make the mistakes that he might have have in the beginning or mistakes that I have on a regular basis, right? So I'm excited to have this gentleman on. We're going to talk about the do's, the don'ts, and everything in between. And if you guys have any questions at all, then you're definitely going to want to reach out to him. But before you guys forget, make sure you hit that notification for Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcasts so that you guys are subscribed. You get the newest episode every single Monday and leave a review. Let us know how you guys are feeling about it and greatly appreciate your guys' feedback. But without further ado, Van, what is going on? How are you today, my friend? I'm very good, Brandon. And I really do appreciate you having me on your podcast and the Facebook thingamajig, like uh, really great stuff. I've been a long admirer of yours. I've listened to a number of the stuff that you've put out and it's a lot of great content. So it's really an honor to be here and I'm looking forward to jibber jabbering with you and getting a lot of good stuff out there to folks that you know, right at that cusp of trying to figure out what they're going to do with an investment property that they have, or even could be their residential home. And they really don't know what direction to go because there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of junk out there with regards to tradespeople and contractors. And, and we've all heard, you know, heard of the horror stories or TV yeah. you know, channels, shows that are dedicated to, you know, contractors, trade people uh, screwing up or, you know, screwing homeowners and property yeah. owners. Right. So I love to delve. Uh, this is a uh, passion about this stuff. So I love to talk about it. I love it. Well, for anybody out there that doesn't know a little bit about yourself or who you are, do you mind just diving into your background, who you are, where you're from? I know you're in Canada actually right now, but you're not always, you know, been in Canada, right? So uh, anybody out there that doesn't know your story, mind diving in? No problem. I've got a, an interesting kind of story and I'm a product of the uh, late 60s, early 70s kind of guy, you know, with the, you know, the, the bell bottom pants and the crazy hair, crazy <laughs> long hair. And uh, I grew up in Chicago and I grew up in a uh, one bedroom apartment with my immigrant parents, along with my younger brother. And, and the whole idea was my parents wanted to save up as much money as possible to go run out and buy their dream home. As they're uh, putting all their you know, little money together, they came across the opportunity of purchasing the apartment building that they actually lived in. Okay. And uh, instead of running out and buying their dream home, they decided to become landlords. And so they went out and they put their down payment down and borrowed some money from friends and family, and they became landlords. What yeah. is your nationality, if you don't mind me asking? I'm actually a Macedonian. Okay. You know what uh, I love? Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of immigrants that come over, they have like the entrepreneur spirit so much stronger than people that are just born here. And it really sparks like... They're always trying to start a business or own the building. And I love that. I wish more people would just have that natural, like, go-getter mentality. And I'll tell you why that is, Brandon. Uh, United States of America and Canada are the greatest countries in the world. They are a magnet for people to come all around the world. And you have people that are in these destitute countries, like the one uh, that my parents came from, Yep. where they're just looking for a chance to set bettering their lives. A chance, and, right? Yeah, like yeah. anything. And yeah. so they can't find it there. So you attract, America is a magnet to attract yep. the best and the brightest in the world because it offers opportunity. Now, it's not for everybody. I've seen people come from Europe, Asia, whatever, come here and then six months later go back because 
they think that uh, roads are paved with gold and you just <laughs> sit back and drink uh, your pina colada and money comes in. It isn't like money. that. You got to work yeah. your tail off. Yeah. But for those who are able to, you know, stick it out, it's not easy transition from to leave your homeland with your native tongue. You yeah. come here with nothing. My parents literally came here with nothing, with, yeah. you know, with a suitcase full of junky clothes yeah. and were able to become what they became, which is, was just tremendous. And that's what you attract. And that's the reason why America is always going to be America, the greatest country in the world, yep. because it keeps attracting the best and the brightest in the world. And that's why I keep telling people when I come across these doomsayers, you know, oh, America is like horrible. Oh, no, no, it's not. No, Try it's living not. somewhere else, I, right? Yeah. <laughs> trust me, Brandon, I've traveled, you know, I've been one of the luxuries of having a couple of dollars to your name. You've been, I, I've been able to travel the world. I've been to China and Australia and Asia and all across Europe. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of misery out there. Yep. We take it for granted the luxuries and life that we lead where we live. And I tell everybody, I do it every single day. I am very, very thankful for yep. all this kind of stuff. I'm thankful for everything that I've been able to accomplish in my life. I'm thankful for the country that I live in. I'm thankful for everything. Like we are truly blessed. And I strongly encourage people to just take a step back, especially when you're hitting a negative or a bad moment in your life. Take when a couple steps back. Yeah. Take a couple yeah. of steps back and really do an assessment of where you are in your life. And you should be thankful for being alive. You should be thankful for being healthy. You should be thankful living in the country that you're living in, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And by just virtue of that positivity that you've introduced in your life, it's amazing how you get a different perspective, a different mindset. Yeah. And that's all of that. That's the name of the game here is the, the mindset that you need to be able to take the ball forward and overcome the fear, the, you know, we get in the little comfort zones all the time. And trying to take a step out of that comfort zone is the most difficult step that people can make. Just like that comfort zone that of immigrants that happen to come to this country every single day, they had to get out of the comfort zone. And they come here and they're able to work their tails off and they become something of themselves is exactly what everybody should be doing as well. Love it. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but I feel like it's so important that, that people know about that. But back to more about your story. Sure. So they bought this apartment building, my yeah. parents, and then what ended up happening was the good old Jimmy Carter, late 70s. And unfortunately, you're too young to remember those days, Bob Brandon, but <laughs> I remember standing in line to pour gas in my car with the old man. I remember its inflation rate being at 18, 20 some odd percent. I remember a ran hostage situation every single day, you know, 473rd day of hostage, all that kind of stuff. The economy was horrible. It was a miserable time. And what ended up happening was this lovely, beautiful apartment building that was 100% occupied, all of a sudden people started to leave. And it started to get to the point where it was like 40, 60% vacancy rate. The neighborhood started to turn into a bad neighborhood where gangs and drugs and prostitutes started moving in. And it got to the point where it was so bad that the landlords, they had no choice, but they would just literally torch their buildings. They would set them on fire to collect the insurance money so that they could somehow salvage something out of their investments and get the heck out of there. So as a family, we hung on to dear life and we're forced to learn and do everything that was, whatever is required in that apartment building, we did it ourselves. Whether it's you know, electrical work, painting, replacing the carpet, roof work, windows, you name it, cleaning toilets. I don't know how many toilets I've cleaned, thousands of toilets in my life. This is the stuff we had to do, whatever we had to do in order to survive. And so that was a background that I came from in learning the business on that side. And eventually things got better, of course. And it was a great investment that I, my parents made yep. and went off to university, graduated and got accepted a couple of law schools, came back home. And my parents were anticipating, you know, that, you know, that lawyer with the three piece suit and alligator shoes. And unfortunately I broke the bad news that I wasn't interested in it. It wasn't me. I yeah. told them my love, the love that I had in renovation, contracting, you know, stuff like that. And I told them that I wanted to open my general contracting business. And so begrudgingly, uh, what are they going to do? They said, okay, go ahead. And that's what ended up happening. So back a long, long time ago in Chicago is where I got started. I went around and on the hustle, trying to drum up business from this person, that person. And ultimately, what I ended up finding out as I was growing my business and networking, meeting people, was I kept seeing the same people over and over again. It was these real estate investors that would buy property, renovate them, sell them. Some of them would keep them around as rentals. And that's where I got this whole uh, this notion, you know, well, let me give you this a little whirl. Let me give this a try. Yeah. And so I remember buying my first little property and 40 some odd thousand dollars is a piece of junk, but I bought it for 40 some odd thousand dollars. I spent at the time, which was quite a bit of money, I put 19, 17 or $19,000 into it. 
And then in two, three months, I had it fixed up and put it up for sale. And uh, I ended up selling it for like 90 some odd thousand dollars. All in all, it made something around $30,000 on, on that flip, sure. which took, which was like a brown, which took only me about four or five months. And at that time, that was in 1991. And at that time, for you to make the average salary back then was around twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Yeah. So I made that kind of money in a course of four or five months, sure. which was a crazy amount of money. And that's when I opened my eyes to real estate investing. And, you know, I haven't stopped. Along the way, over the last 30 years, you know, there have been bumps along the road. But overall, I'm very thankful. I've done very well for myself. I've got a number of successful businesses currently. I'm in land acquisition, I'm a, I'm a builder, uh, restoration work, uh, commercial high rises, and also uh, property management and renovation. So I've got a number of successful businesses where I've been lucky enough to hire great people. And also I venture partnerships with others. Yeah. And I've got over a thousand properties in my portfolio. And that portfolio stretches Michigan, Ohio, New Brunswick, Florida, and I'm a happy camper. Are, are those syndications that you're a part of to get that many doors? That's a lot of doors. No, actually, again, I had cash flow coming in for my businesses. So I would yeah. just take that and plow it into the portfolio. And at the areas that I have properties in, I was able to really do that. Right. And I was doing the Burr strategy before there was ever a Burr. Yeah. Yeah. I love bringing that up too, because it's like the Burr strategy. Everybody is doing it. It's coined that from bigger pockets and it, it's a great strategy, but guess what? It's the, you know, the playbook of any real estate investor, whether it's a single family home, a multifamily or a hundred unit building, thousand unit building, you're trying to buy something to stress, do the full renovation to force the value. And then, you know, rent it out, get top dollar and cash out refi. I mean, that's what it always has been, but yeah. it is funny, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And you can do it anywhere. I decided on the areas of the, where I concentrated because I saw value in those areas. Also, I'm a cash flow kind of guy. Yeah. I love cash flow. I like sleeping well at night knowing that I'm getting yeah. X amount of dollars for my property. Yep. Uh, in places, there's lots of places around North America where you can get positive cash flow. Just it's just it's negative cash flow where you got to pull money out of your pocket. But at the same time, these areas have gone through some major property appreciation and valuation. Appreciation. And right? and you know what we I mean we live in a market of San Diego and crazy where the, yeah where the you know the price points are a million dollars right and what we've figured out is obviously like our properties over in Ohio all about cash flow. It's long-term, you know, doing the birth strategy, but long-term tenants. Uh, so great cash flow. Bless that God took us down that path first to be able to quit our you. jobs and stuff like that. Good for but, you, Brandon. But out here in San Diego, we've just got more creative. So now we do short-term rentals to be able to get more cash flow. And sure, I've looked at that as well. The only issue with that is that it, it's more time consuming, more it is. It, it, it's intensive. Like you got to really be on it because, you know, uh, when you get you into the, build the systems stuff. in place, yeah, you got to put yeah, the systems you gotta, in place and hire out people. <laughs> Otherwise it can be exactly. time consuming. Yeah, exactly. So that was not something that I've considered it, but that was not something that I really got branched off into. There's only so many irons you can stick in a fire. And so I stayed away from it, but I do see merit in it. And if you're successful at it, good for you. I love hearing that kind of stuff. In anything in life, there's always multiple ways of, of figuring it out, of, of attacking it. And oh, yeah. a great business person is always able to find a problem and then find a solution to that problem. It's just a matter of sitting there and figuring it out and you can figure yeah. it out. That's so good. So now that, I mean, it started many moons ago for the general contracting side and how long... Have you done it? I mean, are you still doing general contracting now or? Yeah. No, no, I'm still doing it, but I've had a hard life. As I talked to you off camera, like I've got scars, emotional and physical scars all over my body. I've slept at job sites. I would leave the house at four or five o'clock in the morning, wouldn't come home at eight, nine o'clock at night. I've done whatever I've needed to do to be able to be successful. And it's taken a toll, taking a toll on my family, taking a toll on myself. So I've decided a little while ago to sort of downshift and I've already got great people in place. So on the day-to-day -day side, I got great people that are looking after my businesses and my interests. Yeah. I just sort of peter in every once in a while to make sure everything is on track and we're hitting goals and milestones, but I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operation side. We okay. still do anywhere between 100 to 300 transactions a year. Uh, that could be in the form of buy and hold. It could be a flip. It could be you know that kind of stuff. 
there are opportunities that that happen every single day. And that's something we can talk about. I, I often hear, I've done a lot of these podcasts and I talk to a lot of people and there's this notion that there isn't property out there that is difficult to find a deal. And I shake my head. I open my inbox every morning and I have an opportunity. It's come to be from uh, relationships that I have with real estate agents. I have relationships with mortgage brokers. I have relationships with wholesalers, bird dogs, you name it. In those areas of interest, they know who I am. And I've got opportunities every single day. Now, whether they're actionable or not, I don't know. Depends. You got to look at them. But I I get deals off off market. I never go on MLS. I never do that. I never do that. Yeah, and I feel there, so there sorry for a lot of these, on there. <laughs> but Brandon, Very I feel few. so sorry for a lot of folks that, you know, they, you know, they want to, they, they mean, well, they want to jump yeah. in and they want to go grab that real estate. You know, they want to get into real estate. They have yeah. a couple of dollars that they want to put into it. And their first inclination is to go run off to MLS. And well, MLS, not only you, but millions of other people are pouring through the same properties. Are there any deals on MLS? Yeah. Very uh, few. No, it's, it's very, very difficult. Yep. And oftentimes you got to have a background in something in order to be able to do something with a proper MLS, meaning you need to have a real understanding of renovations because a lot of stuff that people pick over, don't want to touch with a 10 foot yeah. pole are the ones that are all beat up. Yeah. And those course. are really, actually, that's my sweet spot. That's the what ones. I love. Yeah. I guess tips and tricks, right? Like you've seen it all when it comes down to all these properties and distressed. What are you seeing that is the biggest mistake a lot of new people are either overcomplicating or just making on a regular basis when it comes down to dealing with contractors? There's a lot of mistakes that I see that, that I help people with. The first thing that I see is you know, people just don't have a goal and they don't have a goal that they validate before they actually embark on doing any type of renovation. Like depending on the property, depending on your intentions with the property, whether you're going to live in it, whether you're going to rent it, whether you're going to flip it, you got to establish what it is that you're looking to accomplish with that property and actually itemize, literally write it out what it is you're looking to do. So if you've got a property you want to rent, how much you want to rent it for? Write it down. If you're going to flip a property, great. How much money are you looking to make out of it? Write those goals down because everything that's associated with that renovation rehab is going to go be filtered through that actual goal. It's good. And it so will, just not will, being clear on like what you actually want to do with this at the end of the day. So then it's confusing to the contractor as well. Well, I mean, we haven't even got to the point where we're dealing with a contractor yeah. just to, with the virtue of just being able to identify the goal and then validate it. The next step is to validate in the marketplace. You got to get out there. And if you're looking for $1,200 a month in rent, then you better go visit properties in your market, the immediate market, and, and figure out what it is that you need to put into your property, that property renovation, to be able to get $1,200. Yeah. If you're really going to sell it for a certain amount of money, you need to get out there in the marketplace to figure that out before you even talk to a contractor. Yeah. And then, you know what I mean? I was just talking to somebody yesterday, a lovely lady who's got the best of intentions, who wants to renovate her house, calls me up and says, I want to renovate my house. It's a wonderful did you go reach out to some general contracts? She goes, yes. She goes, oh, I got so many contractors that gave me prices are all over the place from $80,000 all the way to $120,000. I said, okay, how do these contractors base their price on? Like on what? Oh, I just told them over the telephone what I wanted to get done. Uh, do you understand, yeah. Brandon? Everybody out there in Facebook land and podcast land, yeah. do you know how many different types of paint there are? You know, I can buy a toilet for $100 and I can buy a toilet for $2,000. Yeah. I can a uh, hardwood floor. You can buy a three by three quarter inch or you can buy, you know, five inch planks. There's so many different types of stuff. How is it possible? And I'm speaking as a general contractor. Sure. How is it possible for me to give you an accurate a dollar amount on something that I, I can't? I'm not fresking the magician that can pull things out of your head. To yeah. figure out what it is that you're looking for, right? Yeah. So that's one of the things I guide people through is you got to create a scope of work. Yes. And a lot of people never heard of this before. Back where I come from, in the commercial side of the business, there isn't a project, Brandon, that I quote on that is, doesn't come to me in a scope of work. Of course. And if I came across a project that said, hey, we're just going to do this and going to do that, I walk, not walk, I run away from that. His yeah. eye as a contractor wants to go in, bang it out, get his money, move on to the next project. Any good contractor, tradesperson, just wants to get in there. They're not looking to screw yeah, people. Yeah. 
just want to get to do the, the job and get the hell out. Yeah. And move you know on what's to the next funny? One. I've yeah. actually made this mistake so many times in the very beginning of walking through with different contractors. I always knew I had to get at least three quotes. So getting different contractors in there, but I would basically walk with them and just say, you know, I don't know, whatever you think needs to be done, right? Instead of going through and getting apples to apples, like knowing exactly what I want being clear, like you said, because I would get three different quotes back and each contractor that I walked through, they would point out something different that I was like, oh yeah, you know, I didn't know about that. Maybe we should fix that. But that wasn't on any of the other quotes, right? So it's all no, over the it, exactly. So how is it that you as a real estate investor, I'm, I'm talking to, the, I'm going to talk on the real estate investment side. If yeah. it's a home that you own, you can have the luxury of trying to, you know, I'm talking about real estate investor sure. who's looking to make money. We're all in this to make money, to create yeah. an investment portfolio that we can, you know, create that financial freedom yeah. that we can pass this portfolio on to our children, our family, whatever. Yeah. And how, so this is a business. So how is it that you can be as a successful business owner, look at a quote and compare apples to apples when one guy quotes one thing and another fella took close and it just doesn't make sense. It does. But we constantly, I see this, like I said, yesterday, yeah, literally happens. had a phone call with somebody who was telling me, yeah, I got these prices all over the place. Okay. And even though it's logical, you and I understand it to this person and to many, many people listening out there on podcast, Facebook land. And hopefully it's triggered a light bulb that's gone on in your head. And, you, and, and, you know, it says, no, you can't do that. It's like taking your car into a mechanic and yeah. just say, how much is it going to cost to repair without a mechanic actually looking at it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense. No mechanic. Like 30 grand, right I'm going to buy a new one. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. no mechanic in his right mind is going to let you do it. It's going to give you a price and it's going to hold down to that price. Because if he says a thousand dollars to repair your car, it could be only a hundred dollars. It could be $10,000. We don't know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So you got to have it. You got to itemize these things. So I'm a big proponent on that. Like there's a lot of things, uh, Brian. That's one of the things that I've gleaned over the course of the last, you know, over 30 years in doing this is that I've got the systems and the processes in place yeah. that is make sure that safeguard uh, myself and anybody to be able to navigate them through the whole the renovation process where they don't, you know, they end up with a property that has increased in value that you haven't dealt with, you know, bad contractors and ultimately, yeah. you got a positive experience where you, you can take that and move on to the next property. Like right now, Brandon, when you yeah. walk into a property that's up for sale, right now, the market is crazy, right? You're walking in, multiple offers, boom, bang, like there's a lot of stuff running around. is isn't like, you know, five, you know, three years ago, two years ago, where you got some time on your hands to be able to look at a property. Right yeah, now, you got to make a snap decision, right? Yeah. So if you are a new real estate investor who comes across an opportunity and you walk through that property, how are you, what position are you in to be able to make an accurate assessment of what the property requires in work? How much is it going to cost your renovations? Yeah. Like we're all looking at ugly ducklings. We're all looking to yeah. find a diamond in a rough. And if you think that you can just call up your contractor friend, or you can just call up that property house inspector to come over to give you a report that charges you three to $500, good luck. Good luck on that process because it ain't going to happen. Because yeah, by the time, the time you make that phone call, yep. guess what? There's three or four guys sitting at the front door waiting to snap up that property. You yep. got to, if you want to be successful, if you want to be on your A game, this is an essential skill set that you need to have to be able to walk in a property, big, 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 be able to identify what it is that needs to happen yep. in that property, put a dollar value and put in an offer. Because if you okay. take too long, it's gone. Yeah. I used to do that. I mean, I'm so guilty of that by taking too long, trying to, wait for contractors or inspections to come through. And and now we're putting $50,000 down hard, closing 10 days, no contingencies, right? And it's like, and that 10 days just gives me the time to see how bad of a, you know, how bad it is. But yeah, so it's, you got to be savvy and know your numbers, you know? So basically you mentioned, you know, be clear on what you want to do in the very beginning and with the renovation and so forth. Obviously apples to apples. What about paying? You know, how do you structure paying? I used to pay cash up front too much before things were done weekly, so many different ways. Now I only pay with credit cards and that gives me security. You know, that if we have a detailed scope of work that really helps guide things in place before and after pictures, they really, you know, can weasel out of something like that. But the mindset of a contractor, usually in comparison to a, 
an investor, it, it is very different, right? For one sense or another, you know, how do you recommend somebody when it comes down to payments? Well, one of the things that I'm a big advocate, and that's the reason why I got involved in this, is that I'm telling people, for the most part, all across North America, on your own properties, you can act as your own general contractor. There are very few places where you actually have to hire a licensed general contractor to do any work or to go in and get a building permit. But for the overwhelming majority, you can do the work on yourself on your own property. And so what I'm an advocate for is you taking this general contractor out of the equation, kicking him, him or her to the curb, and you acting as your own general contractor in the planning and the managing of this particular renovation rehab project. I'm not at all suggesting that I want you to do any of the physical work. Like I've got scars all over my body from doing demolition and chars of glass flying all over the place. I don't want anybody to go out there to do the work themselves. You hire people to do the work and you concentrate on, on the business, not being in the business. So in that process of trying to be your own general contractor, you're going to plan it all out. So I touched on some of the things that you'd be doing, but also in the actual management. And part of the management, of course, is to deal with all these contractors, trades people, the electrician, the plumber, all that kind of stuff. So, and so yeah. how do you structure a relationship with them so that everybody understands what the hell's going on yeah. and everybody's on the same page and you get quality work delivered on time and on budget. And so the very start of this is most important process in this whole caboodle is the actual planning process where, you know, you figured everything out and you have a scope of work. And then when you do tender it out to out there, the contractor to trades people, contractors, they submit their quotes as part of that. You accept one of them. And of course you got to do your due diligence. A lot of people are lazy in this. A lot of people are lazy. You got to get out there and you got to visit these people's job sites and understand what it is that they're doing. Because how do I quantify quality? Quality for me might be a different level than what it might be for you. Sure. Yep. You got to go out there. You got to look at it. You got to spend time on this. But you figure out who the people that you want to do business with. And then ultimately you create a contract. And I walk people through the actual contract process where you make sure you add certain elements in that contract so that you are safeguarded from any issues moving forward, as well, an example. Good. Yeah. There as an go. example, Brandon, I just had a situation where a painter, nice guy, sits out there spraying the exterior of the house. And as he's spraying the house, the spray mist flutters all across the property and lands on the neighbor's car. We got a mucho problemo. Yeah. So now we've damaged our neighbor's you know, property, their car. So I have a clause in all my agreements that says in any situation event that there is, you create damage to yeah. my property or neighboring property that you will be responsible for it and entitles me to deduct X amount of dollars, whatever that amount is from your paycheck pay, sure. right? If you don't have that clause, you can't just arbitrarily pull money away from somebody that you owe money to Yeah. because what they can do then they have the grounds to walk in and slap a lien on your property. Sure. By virtue of putting that clause in the place, that safeguards you because, hey, you cause damage. It says in the agreement that this is the, 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 and you withdraw that from the payment that you're going to make to the trace people. So those are the Good. types of steps that you need to know. That, you know, those are little tips and secrets that That's you great. can only you can only accumulate over 30 years of doing this. You know, I've been through the battles, through the wars, yeah. I've been through the trenches. I know this kind of stuff. And yeah. I'm still learning, by the way. I'm still learning. Yeah, of course. But and nevertheless, you know, these are the types of things. So before you embark on you know, hiring anybody, you establish a payment schedule where these are the certain milestones that you're going to hit. And then that's when you get paid. I see so many people, Brandon, they're running out and they're putting, giving 30, 50 percent deposits to contractors, trace people. It's craziness. It's the against only- the law, first off, because if you are a real general contractor, at least in California, I know the max that you can get is no more than a thousand, or if it's less than that, like twenty five percent, I believe. Of but Brandon, that but Brandon, forget that. I'm talking yeah. about dealing with a plumber. Yeah, I'm dealing with a you know, forget the general so, contractor because we we don't want the general contractor. We sure. know that a general contractor will give you. Let me touch on this quickly. Me as a general contractor, if I came to price out your job. And yeah. it came out to be around $50,000. I'm telling you that 
In order for me to take that on, have a successful business, I would need to be making my cost on it would be thirty to thirty five thousand dollars. Sure. Yeah. And I would charge you fifty. Yeah. Because for me to be there for two three months and only make a thousand or two thousand dollars, that I, I I couldn't exist. Yeah. I have to as a general contractor with all my experience and overhead and all that mumbo jumbo stuff. I have to make fifteen thousand to twenty thousand dollars. And so what I'm saying to people is get rid of the general contractor, act on yourself. And even if you make a couple of mistakes along the way, at least you got a cushion of $15,000 that you can play with. And on top of that, you learn a skill set where you can use it you know, for the rest of your life. But back yeah. to this whole issue about well, putting I got, money down. I, I got to give my two cents behind this because I've tried out both. And for the most part, I've done just dealing with the GC. But on this recent project, it was a tighter budget and it was close by to my actual place that I live. And I decided to just hire out subs. What I've learned from that is that it is a lot more babysitting, a lot more time consuming than any of my other projects have been overall, just because I only had to deal with one person, you know, the general contractor, and he made everything else magically, you know, deal with all the people not showing up or problems or whatever it may be, materials having to get switched out. And I've learned that sometimes if you really want to scale or grow, or if you have other businesses going on, sometimes in my personal experience, I almost prefer to hire that person to manage if they can get me to A to Z without me having to worry about it. And I just need to meet up with one person. It can be a blessing in disguise if, if you try doing it on your own in some cases. Right. And I'm sure every project is different. I know. Listen, I, I totally agree with you. You're a different cat than the people that I'm talking to in regards to these are new real estate investors who might have just purchased their first investment property. And yeah. they're right now in the cups of figuring out what to do with this property because they bought something that requires work, right? Sure. And so you can go the direction of hiring a general contractor, or you could go down the direction of DIYing it and doing it all yourself, which I, I think that's a huge mistake because you yeah, don't know what the hell you're doing. I literally have gone into houses where people have taken out low bearing walls and the house is ready to collapse on itself. I've seen that happen. Ooh, so I don't recommend people doing any of that. And so the third alternative is perhaps to, to do it yourself with some guidance so that yeah. you can save the amount of money that you are spending on a general contractor versus you know planning and managing yourself. Now, the education, the like you said, though, is, is tremendous. You know, actually dealing with the subs, you're going to get a ton of education, too. Yeah. So not, but so in your situation, Brandon, you're a busy guy. I get it. But can I ask you if, you, if this was your first property, what would you have done if this is your property? You're looking at maximizing that that value of that property. And I bet you that first property of yours, you did everything that you could possibly yourself maybe even physically, maybe hiring out the different trades before you got to the point where you actually hired a general contractor. Now you're at a different stage of the game where, yeah, well, you're my, scaling. My, my first dozen properties were all in Ohio while I'm in San Diego. So I had to rely on a contractor just because, and I didn't know enough about construction. So I wanted to really make sure that the person that was guiding me, he knew what the hell he was doing. So okay. I really did deal with a, a lot more just in my particular situation. Your situation is very unique. You would, I would think you would agree. Most people are going to buy an, a, a property that's, you know, that's close by, that's within you know, a couple hours away at the very most. And so those types of people, are they just going to go run out? And I find a lot of people will try to do the DIY because they want to save as much money as possible and then eventually get to the point where they get to a general contractor. And so th those are the people that if you're going to consider doing a DIY, I, I totally discourage you from doing yeah, that. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> no, because I, uh, I've seen, like, I literally have seen horror stories, but at the yeah. same time, hiring a general contractor who's going to charge you as much money as they are. Sometimes when you do the arithmetic, it, you know, it's very tough. Try yeah. it. It's very tough to be able to make, make it work. So sure. that's where I'm at. That's what I'm saying. No, so back I, to I this whole it. general contractor business with the money. Like I, I strongly encourage people that you must, these guys don't give out, you know, trace people don't give out doodles and doodles of money for, for no reason. Don't They're, do it. you know, it's like walking in, you know, the only place that I give money up up front before I get something is McDonald's. I yeah. go to McDonald's, I'll buy my hamburger and I'll wait in line for, you know, I'll wait around to get my hamburger, but that's the only place. And none of these guys are McDonald's. Yeah. So you don't give 30, 50% up front to the plumber, electrician, because they'll claim, oh, it's all for the supplies. And if that is the case, hey, 
I'll go buy those. Put I'll buy. I'll buy yeah. it for you because that's another thing that I'm going to tell you. A little secret. A little tip. Jeez. Yeah, this is big. Um, whenever you enter into a contract with an electrician or a plumber, and you know part of that is that they got to bring material to your site to finish their contract. If you give them money and then they turn around and purchase the material, legally you don't have possession of that material. It lands on your job site. They can walk away with that material, and then you have to chase after and sue them for the amount of money that you've given them overall. By virtue of you going in there and buying it yourself and having your name somewhere on the receipt that you made payment, you got a physical copy of it, you have legal ownership of that material. So let's say the relationship goes sour with that plumber, the electrician or whatever, and they decide to skip out. You, by virtue of you purchasing the material, own the material. And so that's one of the things that I I structure uh, with people that suggest with people that if you are going to get to the point where you're giving that kind of sums of money out, that you bet, you know, that would be one of the steps I would be taking is buying the material and saying, okay, got the material. You shouldn't need very much in the way of money for labor, because again, you got to perform the labor to get paid. And so this idea, I'm going to pay you to reserve you is I do it all the time too. I'm a general contractor. Yeah. I do it too. Give me money. I will take as much money as I can from you to, because I want money up front. Yeah. But the reality is that you don't need money up front. You don't. Now, let me ask, have you come across, I personally have, I've always loved to get quotes on just labor because I can get a better estimate of what it would be and then I'll pay for the materials. But usually I set it up that they have to go to Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, Dixie line with my accounts and I'll pay over the phone. I've noticed on several other projects that they will get more than they need or just wasteful with certain materials. And I'm trying to figure out how the hell I can actually mitigate that and really make it so that they're not being wasteful because that will save me a lot of money. And then I've tried doing a couple ways that, hey, you guys pay for your own materials, like included in the labor. And I've noticed sometimes it works out a little bit better. For me, it's a no brainer. Yeah. As part of my businesses, I build homes. Yeah. I build subdivisions. Every contract that or any, any quote estimate that I receive from tradespeople contractors includes supply and install. Okay. And the reason why I set up like that is nobody that wants to scale wants to get involved and running to the whole local Home Depot to buy, you know, the widget yeah. or, oh, you ran up, you ran short of these widgets. Now go run out and buy some more and whoops. Oh, they don't have any more. Oh, it's a different die lot. Oh, there's so yeah. many different factors involved that yeah. yours truly listen to the expert. I'm yeah. here. I've been over 30 years. Yeah. Don't do that. Always negotiate a contract where supply and install. That way it's amazing. It's amazing, Brandon, how diligent these tradespeople are on the material that they use. It's amazing how material, it doesn't disappear. Hey, you know what? Material doesn't grow legs and walk away. But all of a sudden when I buy it, it somehow, sometimes, sometimes disappears. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You you don't find like empty half uh, boxes of screws and all this other stuff all laying around and just trash, you know? It's a natural human thing. You know, again, if you hire a general contractor, they are one step removed from the whole process. It's not their property. It's not their baby. They don't care. I'm telling you as a general contractor, I don't have the same love and passion in doing work for a client that I do on my own property. It's my property. I love my properties. I sit there hours and stare at my properties because I'm mesmerized by this magnificent structure that I actually own. I literally do that. I love yeah. what I do. And yeah. so for you to step forward and assume that these people are going to love and respect your property and materials as much as you do. No. So yeah, yeah they're going to have a half, you know, the get half a pail of paint that they yeah. don't care about. And they're going to launch it. They don't care. Or they leave the paint can open and the whole paint goes bad. Yeah. Too bad. Sorry. Oh, they made a mistake. But if it's on their shoulders, trust me, they're going to make sure before they leave every night and close up everything, lock it down, make sure that nothing disappears because it's coming out of their pocket. And that's another clause. That's another thing that I insert into people's, into the agreements that I have, a little tip, is that, you know, I don't want to be held responsible for somebody breaking in uh, and stealing something. Yeah. Why should I be responsible for it? I didn't steal it. It's a random act of violence. And let's chase after them. You know, let's get this. SOB and and put them in jail. But why should I be responsible for that? 
right? No, that's but okay. a lot of people don't include that. And then it's a hum and ha where the, you know, trades person contractor says, Hey, you know, we got our, we got all this stuff stolen now, you know, it's got to come out of your pocket. Why? Why should it come out of my pocket? You got we, insurance. We, we've actually had this situation happen before. And thankfully I, I did have, that was one of the only clauses that we've had in that, that saved me in the past and they didn't anticipate it or expect it. A great contractor, but it was a, a rougher area. And luckily I had the guidance from a mentor of mine that told me, Hey, put this in here because it happened to him a dozen times and a lot of friction between him and his contractor. So um, Brandon, it's, I'm glad you touched on the mentorship aspect because this business that we're in, it's not an easy business and no businesses, but the difference between this business and a lot of other stuff is that we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars here that are at stake, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you make a wrong move, it can be fatal. I've seen it happen all the time where people will go in, partner up, or just go in on their own, own buy an investment property. They spend too much money on it. They go on and try to renovate or rehab it. And they end up spending more money than they're supposed to. And they're devastated. They put it in a marketplace and it's a complete disaster. I've yeah. seen families get destroyed over it. And so I like what you did and you just met, touched on something, mentorship, coaching, having somebody there that has, you know, that has gone through the process, who's an expert at it, sitting beside you and helping you through and making sure that you don't make these critical mistakes. How, what's the value of that? It's, I think, I don't know if you could put a dollar value on it. Never mind the confidence that you feel, but also the amount of money that you save from making mistakes along the way, right? You got to think about your time too. I mean, like how much time will that save you? I've had people that I've, I've coached to get started into real estate and they've picked up their first deal in three weeks. You know, like that's, it took me over two years, you know, and 30 plus contracts before I finally got something approved, you know, or accepted. So you know, and, um, yeah, I say that crazy. to be, I, I tell people that all the time. It's like trying to, you know, grab a guitar. You've never played a guitar before grabbing guitar and you trying to figure it out all by yourself, sitting there and strumming it, figuring out how to hold it, whatever, all that stuff. And it's going to take you months, time. years to figure out one little chord or song yeah. versus versus hiring a music teacher, guitar teacher, sitting right beside you and teaching you how to hold it, what to do, how, I mean, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And if you make a mistake along the way, they, you know, they, you know, slap you upside the head and tell you to do it over again. Right. What's yeah. the value of that time yeah. and money, all that kind of stuff. It's, 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 if you want to get to from point A to point B or point Z, like, I, I think that's the only really way to go. And I'm a, I'm a product of that. Like I yeah. spent thousands and thousands of dollars on books, seminars, mentorship, coaching, you name it. We can retreats. I've done that. And that's yeah. the reason why that I have gotten to the point where my life as, as successful as I have become is because of the investment that I made first in myself, yeah. then in real estate, right? Yeah. That's what I encourage people to do is before you start running around and looking at a property, hey, maybe you should make that investment in yourself in time and money. And it gets you in a position where you got the proper mindset and actually seeing things to be able to identify opportunities and go out and pounce on them. And isn't it isn't a wonderful to have somebody right beside your back who's an expert that will be able to help you along the way. And again, hold you back from mistakes and being able to push you in the right direction and hold you accountable, hold you yeah. accountable. Because the biggest problem that I find people is that they're in their little comfort zone. You know, they don't want to step out of it. And if they step out of, you know, if that big step is very difficult. But by having somebody there that's right beside you, pushing you, you know, they are able to get out of that comfort zone. And so Good. I encourage it. I love it. Van, nothing but fire with you. It's a lot of great experience. And I know a lot of the things that you just gave today, the tips, the tricks, and everything in between has been super helpful for a lot of our listeners. You just gave an hour of your time. Is there anything that myself or the listeners could do to give back to you? And how can people reach you? Uh, the reason, uh, Brandon, that I do this and I do, I do bunches of podcasts is that I really am passionate about helping people. I'm doing this because I really enjoyed the interaction. It feeds my ego. I really enjoy seeing people succeed. I understand where people are coming from because I was like that back some 30, you know, 30 odd years ago where I hit a wall at certain points in my life. And I reached out to people where they helped me along the way. And, and again, I'm a product of the people that have helped me. So if, if you're getting interested in getting more information on myself or just about the whole renovation rehabbing process, I yeah. encourage people to go to my website at uh, www.vansturgeon.com. There you'll see a bunch of articles I've written that have been picked up by 
you know, by publications like, you know, LA Tribune and places like that, as well as I've done a number of podcasts that you can listen to where I give certain nuggets out. I'm always into giving nuggets away. And there's a free training video that I actually have on my actual website where people can actually look, indulge in further about the steps that you need to, to do in order to be able to complete your own renovation, where you don't need to hire a general contractor and you can save you know, 30 to 50% on a renovation. And as an added bonus, I encourage everybody to go to my website because there's a particular little tool that people can download. It's a renovation calculator. And I spent several months putting this together with my team, where it's a tool that you grab and all you got to do is bing, 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 put in the square footage of the house, how many stories it is, what are the things that you want to improve or repair or renovate, rehab in your property. It comes up with a budget number. It's a really great tool, especially for that novice who's looking to get into this game, get into this beautiful game where they download it and it gives them a good idea, a sense of how much things will cost. So I encourage people to go on there and download it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really thankful that you're on here and and you're able to spend so much time to be able to give us all these golden nuggets. I know I'm going to be adding things to my contractor's list, my contract in general, just so I'm, you know, I'm staying on top of things and can protect myself more, right? But for everybody out there, if you guys haven't, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so you get the newest notification every single Monday and leave a review. Let us know. Give us some feedback on this episode and all the others. Greatly appreciate your feedback. And if you need any credit repair done for you services, then you can reach out at creditrepairmobile.com. Otherwise, if you're looking to get educated, how the banks are really judging you, how to be able to play the game with credit and be able to fix your credit very quickly within 10 days, 24 hours to 10 days, and then be able to build up several six figures in funding, even up to seven figures in funding on the business side or personal. And afterwards, learning how to leverage it in either real estate, purchasing properties with credit cards like we have, completing all your remodels, doing hard money lending with credit, or even starting up funding your businesses or Walmart automation stores like we're doing, then you can always reach out and apply at credit counselelite.com. We have a lot of awesome content to be in our mastermind group for that. Otherwise, if you guys want to connect with me, you can do so at facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor or Instagram. It's Brandon Elliott Investments. Till next time, guys. Appreciate you guys all so much. We will see you next Monday. God bless. See you, Van. Appreciate you, brother. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.